Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. The discussion of the society that Jane Austen talks about in this novel. It uh, isn't um, a brand new piece of information to say that Sense and Sensibility is a comedy of, of manners. Uh, Jane Austen's novels are all comedies of manners. What does that mean exactly? <clears throat> um, the um, Oxford English Dictionary gives the definition as a type of comedy which depicts the manners, habits or affectations of society or a social class humorously or satirically. This is true of Sense and Sensibility, it's, it's true of all of Jane Austen's novels. Um, it is also true though that Jane Austen uh, endeavours to depict the virtues and the uh, worthwhile values of the uh, level, the echelon, the tier of society that she is discussing. That tier is the gentry. And the gentry are particularly developed social group within British social history. Um, they may exist in other countries, um, but the whole code of conduct, the way of life, the style of living, dress, manners, education, cultural interests, style of language, that pertained um, and perhaps continue to some lesser extent to um, the gentry, um, was a very extensive system of um, social, social behaviour. It characterises that worldwide idea that is held of British society, the understated, the understatement of British social habits. The gentry, um, again, we, we can go to the dictionary to find a definition of the word gentry. It's so Oxford English Dictionary again. Um, the first meaning rank by birth, usually high birth, uh, rarely in the neutral sense. Um, and the secondary meaning people of gentle birth and breeding, the class to which they belong. In modern English use, the class immediately below the nobility. This does very much describe the group that Jane Austen is discussing, uh, the class immediately below the nobility, a group of people who are very well aware that they hold social status. Uh, they wish to continue to hold that level of quite high social status. Um, and also if they are perhaps moving down that chain of social status, they are at pains to um, keep up all the appearances of belonging to the gentry. How does this manifest? How can we tell that people are within the gentry? There are tiers to this group as well, different levels. The upper tier um, are those who are landed. They're closer to the nobility who will have had huge, vast country state, estates and country houses. The landed gentry will not have had such vast estates nor such huge houses, but substantial nonetheless. So the landed gentry, um, because of the power that land conferred on people, uh, carried a lot of authority in their local area. They would have been the um, main landlords of the area. Landlords, of course, had huge power over their tenants at this time. Tenants had very few legal rights. So the landed uh, gentry had this authority and status conferred on them by their land, so that in some respects they could um, conduct themselves in a way that was not dissimilar to the nobility. One might observe that in somebody like Mr Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. Um, their income was derived from their land um, and the way in which the land was managed meant that 
these big landowners lived at home and from their family home, from an estate office within the family buildings, uh, ran their estate and their income was derived from that. They were able to seamlessly um, mix their working life with their leisure life, their work life with their home life. Um, was a very, um, I think for those people who had it, a very uh, enjoyable lifestyle, highly convenient, um, very, very congenial, I think. Um, the gentry, per se, um, those who didn't have land, are related to the landed gentry by ties of kinship, uh, family connections. Usually, um, without having land, it was necessary for them to earn uh, some kind of an income by having a profession. And the professions that the gentry went into were really quite prescripted. The church, uh, the legal profession, um, ideally the higher end of the legal profession, judges and barristers over and above, lawyers and solicitors, there's a clear social distinction made, again, in Pride and Prejudice, between um, Mr. Darcy's relation, who has been a judge, and the Bennett family, who have um, relations who are merely solicitors. Um, other kinds of work that were open to the gentry were the, um, the military, being an army officer, a naval officer, um, and of course being an academic, uh, working in a university um, or working in one of the big um, up-and-coming uh, public schools that were developing at this time. Um, of course as an academic it wasn't possible to be uh, a married man because of course the only people who worked in academia were men. Um, so it wasn't possible to get married and have a family, so it was necessary at that point to leave uh, being a university professor to find a different um, outlet for one's work. Quite often people moved at that point into the church. Um, the, land, the, the gentry um, would have very similar etiquette and manners to the landed gentry, and pretty much the same, and they would um, try to appear to be the same. Uh, with certain um, distinctive um, styles of dress, um, certain um, types of activity that they would engage in, hunts, hunt balls, particular assemblies. Um, they with similar type of education that they would try to have. They would try to educate their daughters to have similar level of accomplishments, to have similar types of accomplishments to their richer uh, relations, uh, the landed gentry. Conceivably, they might derive income from investments, um, but an income derived from investments was not regarded as, as highly as an income derived from land and the investment in property. The gentry usually were not as financially well off as the landed gentry. So their participation in the kind of activities that the gent landed gentry engaged in was um, nearly always a little bit more restri restricted. But it was important to them as much as possible to try to appear to be keeping up. Sense and Sensibility is a novel which is very preoccupied with social status um, and indeed with financial status. Snobbery um, plays quite a big part in the novel. The unpleasant side of being concerned about one's status, not simply about um, that it's more secure to have higher status or uh, that life is, feels a little bit more relaxed and is perhaps more enjoyable. Snobbery is so much more about um, judging the value of another individual by their material possessions or their social status. Um, so it's, a different, it's a different nuance there. Fanny Dashwood is very much a snob in this novel. Mrs Ferrers um, 
Edward Ferrer's mother, Fanny Dashwood's mother, um, is a very um, snobbish woman. Indeed, her whole existence seems to revolve around uh, issues of status and being interested only in associating with people who are of the same status or who can enhance her status. There are certain quite distinctive markers that define the lifestyle of the gentry. It's a world in which inheritance is very important. Inheritance, though, will be chiefly carried on through the male members of the family. And most particularly, uh, primogenitor is uh, of importance, so the eldest male of the family inherits the lion's share of the uh, property. The younger sons will become the gentry. They will go into the church, they will go into the army and the navy. They may make their fortunes and acquire land and property of their own and perhaps begin a slightly new and slightly different dynasty uh, in their own right. Um, but the primogenitor uh, aspect of the way in which um, status descended through the gentry is very similar to the way in which it descend, descended and continues to descend through the nobility. Um, one of the uh, markers then as well, the distinct markers of this society is the financial dependence of women within the system. They are dependent upon the support of their parents or they're dependent um, on the support of their husbands. Uh, if a woman didn't marry um, after her parents died, if she hadn't been provided for, life could be very difficult. Um, and we, we see this in the novel Sense and Sensibility. When Mr Dashwood dies, leaving his wife and three daughters, the estate passes to um, a male heir. It goes to their um, stepbrother. John Dashwood. This social group was of course the social group to which Jane Austen herself belonged. Her father was a clergyman, he did not have land of his own um, and the family income although certainly by no means um, that of penury was not either uh, high within the social group that the family found themselves. Nonetheless they managed comfortably uh, they socialised quite extensively amongst uh, the sort of similar gentry group of their local area in Hampshire. Jane Austen's brothers um, did not benefit from uh, primogenitor or, or, or uh, suffer from it either because there was no major property, no major assets to be left by the father when he died. Her brothers went into the Navy and into the church and into investment banking. When uh, Jane Austen's father died though, the situation of the women of the family being uh, without property and being without professions did pertain. Nonetheless, uh, there was a sense of the necessity for the women to maintain that uh, outward appearance of, of being part of the, the gentry and indeed they would have felt for themselves that they wanted to continue to live um, at that level, in that, in that style of, of um, uh, society. So, in the Austin family, what actually happened was that the brothers all contributed to the upkeep of the mother and Jane Austen and her sister Cassandra. We see something a little bit similar happen in Sense and Sensibility. Although here, the system of primogenitor uh, does have more of a role to play. The Dashwood family lives at the Norland estate. The father of the family had gone to live there to um, assist his uncle. He was the legal inheritor of the estate. However, when the uncle died, the estate was left in such a way as 
that Mr. Dashwood has only a lifetime interest in the estate and can do very little with the estate to actually endow the lives of his daughters and his wife in the future should he die. The estate actually is left to the stepson, the uh, son of a, of a previous marriage of Mr. D Dashwood. Of course the father hopes not to die but <laughs> the story in many respects hinges on the fact that he dies relatively soon. And as soon as the father of the family dies, the three, the four women of the family are essentially dispossessed. The house in which they've been living immediately becomes the property of John Dashwood, the uh, stepson and stepbrother. Um, and he and his family descend into it pretty much immediately in a way which is uh, very... Uh, uncivil um, and as lacks a, a certain level and understanding of, of social grace which might have been hoped to pertain to this particular social group uh, but in this case it doesn't and what we see instead of uh, good manners is a display of, of avarice as Fanny Dashwood and her husband John Dashwood move into Norland. The um, mother of the family, Eleanor, Marianne and, and Margaret Dashwood, the daughters, can stay on for a period but they are now guests in the house in which, you know, that really once belonged to them. And of course they, they, they move away. Interestingly, it is um, a distant relation who eventually offers them a place to live in which um, accords with their ideas of an appropriate abode for their social standing um, and he is a member of the landed gentry. So they move from the Norland estate where they themselves have been landed gentry to another estate where they become gentry but tenants uh, of the landed gentry. So in some ways we see this as a kind of a social network, uh, but one in which one may find the processes operating to one's disadvantage, or that occasionally the network as well picks people up and holds them within the system uh, because they belong to the system, they're looked after by people within the system. So although we find ourselves um, early on in the story um, very much within the world of the landed gentry in different ways, nevertheless uh, money and financial status, not just social status, not just birth status, are given a great, is given a great deal of space in this novel. There's considerable discussion and indeed considerable detail supplied about the size of house that people live in, the number of rooms that they have, the number of um, sitting or reception rooms that they have, the number of bedrooms that they have, uh, the, the extent of their land or their grounds. We um, have a good idea of people's exact incomes. We know how much money they have in investments. We know how much their income is. We know, for example, exactly how much income Colonel Brandon's estate generates. Um, as well, women's fortunes are precisely, very precisely given. How much money a woman will bring into a marriage is common knowledge amongst <laughs> all the people that she's mixing with, which would, would tend to make it easy for men to choose, if they need a little bit of extra money, tend to make it very easy for men to choose why, um, from whom they can acquire this money, because of course any fortune or um, property owned by a woman became her husband's 
on her marriage. It was possible to tie property and investments up in such a way as the husband only had a lifetime interest in them or that he wasn't able to directly access and spend money or directly sell property. This wasn't such a common arrangement. Um, so, as we um, become aware, there's a, a Miss Morton floating around with a fortune of £50,000 to her name. There's another Miss Gray floating around who has got considerable um, amount of money behind her also. And they, they become very highly eligible marriage prospects, um, either for men who wish to increase their fortune and status, or for men who have lost their fortune and <laughs> need to regroup. Um, it was very easy to calculate how much income, how much disposable income a woman had by knowing her um, sort of overall assets because these fortunes, as they are called, would have been invested in government bonds usually which yielded a 5% um, interest. So it was possible from that to calculate what the actual disposable in income of any given woman was at this time if she had a fortune. Other ways in which um, financial status of different characters is conveyed is with regard to whether or not they keep horses, their own horses that they hunt with, whether or not they've got a carriage or two carriages or <laughs> however many carriages. Um, and also the number of servants that people were able to have. There's considerable discussion about um, every time a couple might be getting married. Mrs Jennings speculates on, you know, how many servants they could have or who, who would make a suitable servant if they could only manage one servant. It needs to be a maid of all work. Um, so certain servants would be too delicate because evidently uh, there would be servants for um, the more uh, sophisticated activities in uh, sort of maintaining bedrooms and clothes and um, you know all those things to do with um, in a sense valeting the family. Uh, those would be more delicate over and above the scullery work, scrubbing, cleaning, uh, washing dishes, etc. It may be interesting in this discussion to consider the role that gender stereotypes are playing. Um, the stereotype of the critical, henpecking, um, bossy wife um, and the cardboard cutout husband. The um, stereotype of the um, <laughs> woman who you know, is just simply happy to be married and just toddles along in, in the state of marriage and being a mother and family and doesn't really look beyond that um, either. Um, also the stereotype of the wicked stepmother um, who isn't always a stepmother. Mrs Ferrers isn't a stepmother but she sort of takes on that um, malevolent matri matriarchal role. Um, Fanny Dashwood almost to some extent does does as well. One could see Fanny turning out very like Mrs Ferrers in the future. She is after all her daughter. Um, Lady Middleton as well, the um, status conscious wife who um, is really you know not interested in her own achievement but who displays uh, the achievement of her husband or the social status of her husband through her every action. These these are sort of stereotypes. Um, and they didn't just exist in the 18th century, I don't think. Um, so it's difficult to say that each individual character nevertheless does come forth with specific qualities and character characteristics which are um, explicit to them. Nevertheless, in these more minor characters we may see, exactly as I say, stereotypical or archetypal type qualities that are stock, um, 
stock features of society, stock features of literature or drama even as well. Another uh, single woman whom we get to know quite well apart from Marianne and Eleanor is of course Lucy Steele. Like Marianne and Eleanor, Lucy Steele is very resourceful. However, she is resourceful in different ways. She's re resourceful in ways which are deceitful, which are um, flattering um, and insincere. Um, and she also engages uh, Eleanor in a situation uh, which is extremely manipulative, where Eleanor is keeping Lucy secret at the same time as Lucy knows perfectly well that um, this situation is must be very painful for Eleanor, but she wishes to control Eleanor because she is such a threat. Uh, nevertheless, as a single woman, as an unmarried woman, she is very active in how she thinks um, and very resourceful unlike the married women who seem to have descended into a sort of status quo inertia. They have their position, they have their role, they don't really need to do anything more from here, specifically as individuals. They can just carry on because the system is supporting them. What will happen to them in the case of their husband dying and that they're not provided for um, because the estate, the Norland estate, is left first to John Dashwood, but then to his son, whom the original uncle owner of the state was so taken by, the infant. So Fanny Dashwood may find herself in a very similar situation to the original Mrs. Dashwood. Um, one day, um, Mrs. Palmer, who knows, may as well, if her husband dies and all the money has gone, who knows? Um, he's after all busy getting himself into Parliament, which was a very expensive business. Um, so this is a, a dual-edged situation really, I think, um, and there's a sort of possibly false security being exhibited by a number of the married women uh, in the novel. Mrs Jennings and Mrs Ferrers are relatively unusual in the society of the day in having been left in a charge of the inheritances that they, they, they you know, the, the, the finances that they're making use of to live their lives at, um, you know, quite a comfortable level, really. <laughs>